Welcome into Halos in the Infield podcast with your host, Todd Fox, along with the other co-host. Fernando, good morning, everybody. Yes, we're uh, we're doing a little Zoom call here with a special guest by the name of Darren Sutton. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you guys for hanging out and uh, excited to get to meet you, get to know a little bit about you guys. And, uh, you know, as I've said from the beginning, well, actually, since I was about 15 years old, Angels fan through and through. So let's hang out and be fans together. I uh, see. That's what we love to do on our page, right, Fernando? Absolutely, through and through, for better or worse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love talking baseball, Darren. Um, and you know what? One of the things that uh, you know, before we get into anything, I just wanted to say uh, congratulations on being the, one of the broadcasters for the Angels. Uh, you know, a, a change happened, and uh, and we want to know how that uh, how that came about because uh, you know, with a, with a change in, in our, uh, our commentators. Uh, the angels were looking for someone that was, you know, had experience and everything. And, and we were, when you came, when your name came up, a lot of angel fans did know you from the past or have seen you on TV, but we want to know like how, how that come about for you. Gosh, it was kind of a crazy winner. Um, you know, I had, I had been in the running and I say this very humbly for opportunities uh, with White Sox radio, with Cubs television, uh, with Cincinnati television. I've kind of reached the point in my life fortunately, as an empty nester now where I was a little bit more open to giving it a try. I don't know that I was in the past. I, mm -hmm. I stopped announcing in 2012, not by choice with, uh, with the Diamondbacks, but it turned out to be a super, super great blessing. You know, I, I, I finished my contract with them. I, I got compensated for four more years. I recreated a new career in the amateur baseball space with Perfect Game. Got to know prospects as they came through. We you know, developed three Sirius XM radio shows. We have a streaming network now. Um, so it's been amazing. But I did hold out hope that, hey, maybe there's some place where I can do this again. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, as you mentioned, Victor decided to make a career change. And after watching him for so many years, as an Angels fan from afar and checking in on the team with, <laughs> with Ian Gooby, um, I, I guess I hoped. I hoped there might be a fit there. Uh, had a chance to communicate. Uh, with Joe, who I, Joe Madden, who I've known through the years and, um, you know, certainly once communicated with, uh, with John Carpino, uh, the leader of, of the Angels, obviously, as the lieutenant to Artie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it seemed like there was going to be a possibility. Uh, they, they reached back out through Valleys, um, had some really good conversations. You know, as they build things, things are, you know, a little bit cryptic and quiet because they're trying to figure out what they wanted to do. In hindsight, I knew that they really wanted to work with Matt and uh, Vaskersian. And, uh, and as things came to fruition, I actually was asked, a, a while went by, weeks, a couple of weeks. And uh, I was asked, I was traveling back to visit my daughter in college with my wife and received communication from Bally's, the leaders at Bally's said, hey, we'd like for you to do a demo with Gooby. Mm. Uh, kind of like this. I mean, it was kind of like this. <laughs> I mean, I had a game here and the screens there. And, um, and so we did, we did. And it was just a couple of innings of a game from last year. Um, you know, we had good chemistry. We had a good time together. I think they wanted to make sure I could still do it, um, and uh, which was fair. You know, I hadn't been at the big league level for a long time, done hundreds of games of play-by-play, -play, but college sports, amateur sports. Mm -hmm. um, but that's fair. So went well. And in the end, when it all came together, I received a communication. They hopped on a Zoom. Uh, Mike Conley, who's the national leader of, of all things Valleys, and, um, and then the leaders, uh, John Hefner and and Ed Barnes brought me in and on Zoom and said, hey, you're one of our guys. And then they shared with me, can't say anything, Matt is too. Um, and I can't tell you the joy. And, and I reached out to my guys with Perfect Game. That was the most important thing to me because they are so crazy loyal to me. And I said, are you guys up for this? Can we do this? What should I do? And they said, go do it. Make it work. Double duty this year and see how it goes and figure it out. So um, it's been a blessing. At times when I feel a little bit fatigued, the energy comes when I sit down in that chair at the booth at night and all of a sudden I get a whole new wave of energy. And, you know, you, you work, you, you've, you and I have talked about it. You work those second and third shifts sometimes, but yeah. um, my second, my second shift is at the ballpark and man, I get a lot of energy. That's awesome. Look, I've been up there in the press box, obviously not during a game, calling a game, but I've had the privilege of being able to sit down there, you know, on tours and things like that. And let me tell you, man, and I'm, you'll be the first, I'm sure to agree that view is one of the best views in baseball. Mm -hmm. 
No, no, it is. It's funny. I can remember obviously being an announcer in 2000 and 2001 as a baby and doing radio from the same spot a couple of booths down. And I'll always recall how great it was. I always think the one that maybe hangs with it just a little bit is San Francisco. The only difference is you have the water and that's what makes it different. It's a, it's a, it's a yeah. different situation. But I always put the big A right there with San Francisco. San Francisco has those high tops. So you're sitting up taller. <clears throat> um, you know, your perspective is amazing. But the, the floor to ceiling space you have, the fact that you're not inhibited with, you know, a pop that goes up where maybe you're, you're, you're leaning out, it's ridiculous. That's prime real estate, right? And, and we saw that blow with what, what used to be the press box uh, and also the press dining room down below has become, you know, a restaurant and suites and such, as it should be. Because where we sit is really, really prime real estate. And we're fortunate to be able to sit there, to have that depth perspective. It's incredible. You're right. I mean... I'm still like you. I'm still like you every time I sit down and can't believe the, the perspective we get with technology in front of us. And, and then it's so easy to enjoy the game. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing spot. And what about, do you ever call any games there uh, in Anaheim before it was transitioned into the baseball-only ballpark? No, I didn't. I went to many of them, like, yeah. you know, yeah. and attended many of them. I was a kid and a bat boy and a ball boy at many of them. But uh, no, never. Never called any games. I mean, when I sat down in 2000, you know, kind of like I felt this year, I was 29, 30 years old, and I was thinking, this is my dream job. Well, 21 years later, I got that same kid-like feeling. Um, but I sat down and thought, okay, I'm going to announce Angels games. Like, I love this. This is, they let me play for them in the minor leagues. I went through their ups and downs in 86 yeah. and 87, working in the clubhouse. So, yeah, yeah, I had never called an old school game there. Been there a ton, but never called one. And see, that's, <clears throat> that's the thing real quick. A lot of fans don't know you actually played minor league ball. And then the fact that, uh, you know, obviously your father playing for the Angels for those few years, you were around the team a lot. You know, a lot of people don't know you grew up an Angel fan. So, I mean, that's that's pretty cool. Um, you have that, you know, connection. That's why I was asking you, too. Like, you must have been excited, you know, calling. You know, that's everyone's dream, you know, either playing for the team you rooted for as a kid like you did and then obviously now calling the games i mean that must be a, an amazing feeling and i'm glad you had the uh, you know the backing from your family you know your daughter's not being there grown up which is but i'm, I'm sure they're supportive your wife obviously and then your your team that you had that so that's all good to hear how everything worked out for you yeah i'm blessed by it i'm incredibly blessed and it's a day-to-day -day situation right as, as all of our lives are um take nothing for granted uh you know understand this will be an evolving an evolving broadcast situation and hope to be a part of it long term. Um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, and really my formidable years is when I fell in love with the Angels. I, of course, was a Dodger kid because my father played for them. Yeah. He left the Dodgers. He left the Dodgers when I was 10. <laughs> so my fandom hadn't really formed yet. Right. I mean, when I was 10, he left the Dodgers. He was an Astro for two years. Mm -hmm. He was a brewer for a couple of years. And I love those brewers, man. And I got a chance to call games there. But um, and then when I was playing and playing high school baseball at Capo Christian and, and, and we moved to, you know, to Orange County from the, from LA when he was traveling for other teams, all of a sudden I became an Orange County kid. And then my father joined the Orange County team and it was on, I mean, because, because that's when I was truly getting the game. I wanted to be those guys. I wanted to be Mike Witt. I wanted to be my dad. I wanted to be Kirk McCaskill at that time. And so for me, that I think people, LA folks and, and, and SoCal folks think, wait, Dodgers, your dad's in the, you know, his numbers. Are yes, he's in the Hall of Fame as a Dodger, as it should yeah. be. But I was 10. That's his journey. My journey is I was 10 when he left there. I fell in love with the Angels. They've been my team. I still enjoy the Dodgers. I don't have the disdain that you have, under, but I get it. I'm fine with it. <laughs> I love it. It makes it You healthy. have the disdain. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's okay. It's okay. And I love that, that fandom. I don't have that. And, and I think for obvious reasons, when your dad's numbers on the wall and they're on the sleeves this mm -hmm. year when he passed, it's hard to have that level yeah. of disdain. But I'm an Angels fan. I mean, I, I'm an Angels fan. That's yeah. my team. Once I, especially once I, you know, when I was with the Brewers, we'd play, you know, Angels on a, on a, you know, play cross interleague play. When I was Diamondbacks, we'd get a chance. I'm an Angels fan. I mean, I'd have to, to be quiet and kind of pull for my team that I'm broadcasting for. But so that's why I think when people ask about wait, not Dodgers, again, I was 10. When I was 15, 16, 17, I fell in love with them. And then, you know, I played for them a couple of years later. Not well, but I played for them. True, true. <laughs> so uh, you alluded to right now, uh, by, 
with uh, saying that you work with the Brewers. Now, uh, Matt Vaskersian also worked with the Brewers. You guys were essentially two ships passing in the night as he was leaving as you were coming in, correct? Correct. It seems we're two ships passing in the night again. But, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. correct. We're, we're, we're in a more intimate version of that now. We, we <laughs> both pull for cheer and cover, you know, and he's a Cali kid too. I mean, he, he his heart's out west, but we both do that and we seem to pass. But yes, I, I replaced him. I was lucky. I replaced some pretty high standard guys. And, um, and, and with Matt in Milwaukee and a young, young Matt, like a really talented Matt who had hugged that fan base and they loved him. And then I replaced the only voice the Diamondbacks ever had in Tom Brenneman. Um, so for me, I was, you know, it was, it's, it's been cool to come into high standard jobs. And now here again, I'm not the lone replacement for Victor, but a guy who's been there for a generation, who has iconic calls, who touched the fan base. It's an honor to replace people that keep the bar high. It's a lot of fun. True. True. Um, I had a question though, since you brought up the Brewers, uh, how, how close were you or to Bob Euchre? Uh, like, like, cause, cause he, is he that quirky and funny in person as well? Cause I, I loved him on like, obviously on TV shows and stuff like that, Mr. Belvedere, but when he calls games and when he's on the movies, I mean, is he, is he that kind of guy too? Like, is he that spontaneous, like that witty? Absolutely. He's amazing. You, <laughs> you want to steer clear if you really want to mix it up with them. And, and, you know, those Brewers teams, I had the, the bad luck award, right? I, I, I went for a TV job, you know, from number two on radio with the Angels. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I left. I left after the 01 season. And then in 02, the Brewers, you know, lost 106 games. We know what the Angels did, right, in 02? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but but the point is, when I, my five years with the Brewers, we didn't win much. We were 81 and 81 was the very, very best year. And I loved every moment of it. Um, and Bob was part of the reason. I mean, he his sense of humor, his ability to bring the fan base. And I learned a lot, you know, just being close to him. He's not the kind of guy that says, hey, come on, kid, let me teach you. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned a lot watching how he handled the game, dealt with the players, used humor where it was appropriate. Oh, my gosh, he's exactly that same guy. And to the point that you were making about, you know, what a star he was. We may have had Jeff Jenkins and Richie Sexton and, and veterans like Eric Young. But he was by far the most popular brewer. There, you know, he didn't wear a uniform. He wore a golf shirt. But he was by far. <laughs> when we pulled up at our buses, our buses in Houston and St. Louis and Cincinnati, when we pulled up and fans were waiting for autographs, Richie Sexton and Jeff Jenkins had to wait. They wanted to talk to Bob Euchre. So, yes. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I would listen to him on XM, uh, you know, at times because he was just hilarious. You know, I'd listen to Brewer games. Yeah. Heck of it. Um. I'll go ahead, Fernando. Oh, uh, so I was I wanted to ask about the 1986 season uh, through your perspective. So your father was obviously part of an Angels team that went 92 and 70, and they won the division that year. What do you remember about that team? Because that was a team that a lot of people were excited about. There was a lot of talent on that team. That was a very loaded team. So what do you remember from your perspective? I remember it was a mixed bag, right? I mean, like any good team is, I can remember the intensity of Brian Downing. Mm -hmm. um, and not understanding how he played as good a defense as he did, which was above serviceable because he was so strong and hulking like. Yeah. You know, I, I remember players. I remember players joining the team throughout who were important to the team. I remember how important Bob was. I, re I remember Wally. You know, and still to this day, Wally's my favorite angel. Always will be because I was impressionable and he was cool and he was good, right? Yep. Um, yep. And he was a decent. And he was a decent man. And I didn't know it then, but that's another reason I was drawn to him. Um, I, I just remember the different moving parts. And I remember Gene Mock, uh, what a leader he was. Um, I was selfish at that time. Gene Mock allowed me to be a part of the fun, if you will. He, you know, his rules were uh, allowing somebody who was old enough and handled their business well enough to be around. And my gosh, I don't know if I'd be having this job and this unique career I've had without a guy like Gene Mock saying, come on in, you're allowed in here. Um, because it gave me perspective. Awesome. But... Uh, that was a very, very good team, right? I mean, with, with Gary in center field, with uh, a mixed bag of guys, you know, playing in right field, with Downing playing in left field. Um, it was a very, very talented team. I can't say I remember game by game by game, but boy, I remember late in that season. I remember being, you know, getting stuff out of the dugout when they clinched. I remember when the ball sailed out in left field, being not too far from Gene Mock and going back into the clubhouse and tearing the plastic down in the locker room because they were going to celebrate, which... They did not. 
mm-hmm. and helping to get the champagne out of the clubhouse. I remember be going to Boston, um, getting a chance to go to Boston for those last two games, and the the 16, 17-year-old in me um, was thinking, well, it's just one more game, and then yeah. being saddened by being saddened by the fact that um, it, it wasn't going to happen. Momentum had swung their way, and I, I got the bat boy in those games at Fenway Park, and I can remember kneeling like and hollering out encouraging words. I wasn't dumb, but hollering out encouraging words. Uh, I believe Clemens and Boyd may have pitched in those couple of games you know, towards my team and having Pettis turn around and acknowledge my cheers. I mean, those are the things I remember. I don't remember it as much journalistically, quite honestly. I don't remember hitting streaks. I don't remember. I'm giving you a 16, 17-year-old's perspective of, of what I remember. Um, and it was, a, it was a fun team. 86 and 87 melts together a little bit with me. Mm-hmm. So I think about George Hendrick joining and how kind he was to a, six, to a 17-year-old kid. I think about Rupert Jones and his smile joining. I I think about, you know, John Candelaria. And even though he and my dad had a much publicized disagreement off the field, he was nothing but kind to me. Um, Donnie Moore, who's no longer with us, you know, yeah. again, being a 17-year-old, who'd go get him chili dogs during the game um, <laughs> and then drive drive him down in the tunnel to so that he could check in in the seventh inning and come in in the ninth. Um, yeah, those guys were super inclusive. And I was as heartbroken as you guys as anybody else when that ball sailed out. I had this optimism that I, in hindsight, I look around and I don't know that I, I had a youthful optimism. I don't know that any, everyone in that room had that same optimism. Well, two questions on that. And that's an amazing uh, story and experiences that you had from being in the clubhouse with that historic angel team. But one of the questions, one of the questions I had uh, to follow on that was how were, were you scared at all when they clinched? Because you don't really see that, especially nowadays. When, you know they have security up there for a reason. But and when we watch all those old videos, what happens in those games? They storm the field. I mean, it was like <laughs> a, a college football game. There was fans everywhere. Were you guys or your father? Uh, did they ever express, uh, uh, you know, the feelings of maybe being a little worried about fans being a little too uh, over anxious? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I was given pretty strict instructions that. Uh, I'm out of here and you're out of here too. So get up that <laughs> tunnel and help out where you can be doing it. Um, heck, my father was a wonderful addition to a team statistically and you wanted him every fifth day, but he wasn't a rah-rah guy. So mm-hmm. he was the guy that was going to do, you know, whatever needed to happen uh, and then get out. He was he was <laughs> okay. always very much, he was a team guy every sense of the word, but he wasn't that pom-pom dog pile guy. That wasn't his personality. All right. Um, but yeah, and, and remember like, you know, it, it that crowd, that that situation um, wasn't, uh, you know, that wasn't an angry mob. Oh, and yeah. I think there's a big, big difference. And but I do remember that. I, I absolutely remember that. I didn't vividly see most of what I remember. I've, I see in video because I was out of there. I was absolutely okay. out of there. I was the same. I had no place in that celebration anyway. I had no place <laughs> in that celebration. I did sneak out when my dad won his 300th. I came out with everybody else. Because I had a place in that celebration, or so I thought, but I think go. it was a fair spot. But yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think you would agree that you had a place in it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, bu- I, I bugged him sometimes and asked him for money and <laughs> bothered him for gas money. And that was my, and, and, you know, sometimes got stopped for missing curfew. That was my place. But yeah, I had a place in it. Hey, I, as parents, we all know that that's, that comes with the territory, right? We signed up for it. Yeah. So. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Amen. I mean, we've been talking about that in our pre-interview for sure. Absolutely. You're right. Absolutely. Oh, and one other question. In your mind, I know it didn't happen, obviously, but had the Angels got past Boston, do you think they take out the Miracle Mets? Sure. Why not? I mean, yeah. I mean, why not? I mean, obviously, they were having to adapt and, and work through, you know, different situations. But why not? Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, the, the Miracle Mets had a good year. They had, you know, they that was an incredible team and, you know, depth of roster to remind myself of all the names because once the Angels were out, I didn't pay a ton of attention. Uh, <laughs> historically, I have a, historically, I have a lot, obviously. Um, but sure, I mean, there's no reason to say that they couldn't have, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father had a knack at that point of winning g- big games, um, you know, and, and and his mates and, and Mike Witt, and it would have been a nice matchup, certainly. My father also had a, had a confident approach to National League, you know, style and National League hitters. So, yeah, why not? Yeah, we, we felt that we've talked about this, me and Fernando. We were like, man, if the Angels could have gotten past Boston, that would have been a really, really good series. I don't know if it would have had the dramatics of the Buckner stuff, but uh, yeah. I think it would have been highly entertaining with the amount of stars on both sides. I mean, it would have been a knock-em-out, drag-out kind of series. 
when there's a way to look at it too, right? And, and you know, my bosses, I'm sure, uh, don't always love this. But let's be honest. If you look at the history of the two franchises, they would have been the two baby brothers playing each other mm-hmm. uh, while the big brothers watch. Yep. Um, you know, Dodgers came first. Angels came next. Not a big gap there. Um, but Yankees came way first, and then Mets came a lot later. So, um, you know, Dodge, there, there maybe is a big gap because the Dodgers were born uh, a long, long time prior to that back east. But it'd be the two little brothers fighting, and that'd be a blast to see. It's like these youth tournaments I do or these prospect tournaments I do where the B team is in the championship game and the big star team with all the D1 commits is watching. So, yeah, it would have been fun. <laughs> That's cool. Well, you had something, Fernando? Yes. <clears throat> so – did the high school Darren ever get a chance to meet Gene Autry? Gene Autry is widely respected as one of the greatest owners in sports, according to people who got to play for him. So uh, how did you get to interact with him, if you ever did? And was your dad as big of a fan as a lot of other players who got to interact with Gene Autry? My father was a huge fan because his father was a huge fan as an entertainer. My dad had such respect and reverence for his father, who was – you know, a blue collar worker his entire life started out, you know, sharing a house on a farm with his family and then got into construction uh, out on roads and then became a superintendent. And until the day, you know, he retired was a blue collar man. And so um, he out of reverence for his father, who loved the entertainment of Gene Autry, he was thrilled to get to know, to play for. And they had that kind of relationship. And so, yes, I did. Um, the main time where there was time was when he won his 300th game. We kind of got to have a private room for a little bit with, with Mr. Autry um, and, and my grandfather and just different people that were important. And I think that's what meant the most to my dad was to have the people that meant the most in his life and get to introduce them to, to Gene. And I think he felt a, you know, a, kins, a, a kinship with him, you know, a kindred spirit, you know, relationship with him because of that. So yeah, I did. And he was bigger than life to me, even though I'm far too young to understand his entertainment at that point. I knew he was a big, big figure, man. He was the cowboy. He was the owner of the Angels, and he was my dad's boss. And my dad had never had a boss like that, you know. Bud Selig didn't look like that. Um, Certainly the O'Malley's didn't look like that. Um, And so it was a cool boss to have and, you know, a legend, a legend. I knew what I read. I knew what he had done. So, yeah, to interact with him, um, it it was big time a thrill, yeah. Yeah, I, I obviously never got a chance to interact with him. But, you know, if I can go back in time, that, that would certainly be somebody who I'd like to get to meet. You know, I, I'd like to get to meet the singing cowboy. Mm-hmm. So Yeah. The man, the myth. A real the- guy. Yeah. A real dude, though. Yeah. I mean, like a real, real dude. Like when you run into Artie, like kind of a real dude. You expect this, oh, moment. And <laughs> you feel it. In, you feel it inside. And mm-hmm. I still do when I run into Artie. But then they just want to be guys with you and, and and men and women and just talk normal with you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I have a friend who works for the Angels. And the, the most down-to-earth story I've ever heard about Artie Moreno was he was walking down the halls. And Artie stops him to ask where, you know, a certain room was. <laughs> it's just like, you know, he, he is a real guy. He does you know, he gets lost. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. He's a good boss, for sure. Um, I want to transition into the current Angel team, though, right now. Um, there's this guy, I don't know if you've heard of him, Shohei Otani. I hear he's pretty good. What are your thoughts on when, when he's in the batter's box? It's fun because I've covered guys that take big swings, you know, mm-hmm. that are fearless in attacking the baseball. Um, but I don't know that I've covered many like him. You know, there are aggressive hitters. One that comes to mind is like a Jeff Jenkins. Uh, of the Brewers he always always came uncoiled when he swung when he attacked the baseball that that was his approach and he was seeking a homer I covered a baby Justin Upton who hit a ball a million miles a lot of times and had aggression but it wasn't consistent aggression so I don't know that I've seen that height um, that extension with the arms and Mm -hmm. that athleticism in one package together um, with the ability to drive pitches that that shouldn't be driven like it if you have one happy zone, I get it, but his happy zone's bigger than that. And his happy zone, like I, I think it was earlier in the year, I, I'm going to not recall every pitcher, every time, every situation, but a left-hander, Lazardo, Lazardo maybe, the kid from Stoneman Douglas in Florida, hard-throwing left. He still hasn't quite figured it out. Uh, Matty was on the call, and I remember it because I was watching from home, 
And if I recall correctly, Lazardo was throwing mid to high 90s and he threw a fastball away, like off the plate away. And Shohei pulled it out, like pulled it out. <laughs> yeah. um, so for me, a lot of his homers to left are breaking balls that he stays back on or changeups that he stays back on. But um, I don't, I've never seen that combination before of the height, which to me, I'm always being a six, five guy and unathletic as can be, <laughs> I've always had respect. I've always had respect for Dave Winfield, for a oh, Richie yeah. Sexton, for guys who have longer Great limbs names. than our hitters. There's just more moving parts. Mm -hmm. And so Shohei's six, four, but he's, he's got the wingspan of a guy six, six. You can see it. Yeah. That's where he yeah. creates the good extension on the mound. So, um, it's a unique combination, guys. It's super unique. I've never seen it. I've heard a couple Absolutely. of your calls when, when he hits a home run to left field. I mean, you almost sound shocked in a way because it, you don't think he got enough of it to get it out. And then when he hits it out, you know, you, you sound as amazed as <sighs> we are when we see it leave the fence. I mean, that's got to be fun to watch. Uh, and then a uh, follow-up to that is me and Fernando were talking. We did a podcast the other night. And with Fletcher's resurgence and his average going up, you know, when Upton gets back, when Rendon is healthy, and obviously Trout coming around the corner, you already got two pillars or three pillars with Fletch, Walsh, and uh, Otani. When those five or six, you know, first guys in the lineup are all in there and all hitting, you know, with Stassi and Iglesias and the, and the other guys that are in the lineup, I mean, do you think this team is, I mean, because we feel it could be like the number one hitting team in the league when, when everyone's healthy. I mean, it, that must be exciting for you to call games as it is for us to watch. Yeah, and, and I hope that that all happens. I hope they all get healthy. I hope Anthony finds who he was for the majority of his career and finds his health. Mm -hmm. um, we know Mike's coming back, and it's I'm pretty confident that Mike will be some version of what he was to open the season and what he's been throughout his career. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Justin, again, Justin, uh, I'm not sure where he'll hit. Justin's incredibly talented and streaky. I was around a 19-year-old Upton and called a bunch of his homers. But, yes, I'm excited to have him back. And, uh, yeah, it could be a very, very dangerous – already it's a dangerous offense. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, because, because guys like Goslin, you know, who, again, you, how far can you extend a guy like that? Um, you know, but guys like Goslin are doing special things, right? So if you have a guy like – you know, when you look, I mean, I have it up here. Like that 318, 370, 455, that's real. That's not fake, and that's not 12 Absolutely. at bat. So – so guys like that to help if Anthony's not ready, guys like that to help and left if Justin's not ready. Um, yeah, I'm excited about, you know, the second half of this team and excited to see what happens. You know, Suarez struggled. I think he tried to be, and I know you might ask about pitching, but he tried to be somebody who was not suddenly in, in his lone starting chance. And let's hope he kind of relaxes and doesn't overdo it. Um, the pitching remains a question mark, but Alex pitched well. Uh, I think Alex is a good second half guy. Shohei's the ace of this team. Um, Andrew is a guy who, you know, you should just continue to have high expectations for. But I'm excited about this offense. I, I really, really am. They're fun already. I think the key for me is it will make people pitch to Otani more and Trout more, right? Yes. Um, Walsh, Walsh kind of gets to be the bodyguard for both, no matter where they put him. <laughs> um, it will make – and, and Justin's going to get – if Justin comes back, I don't know that Justin does move back to the top. That will be Joe's call. Um, because Fletch is thriving in that spot right now, but Fletch could thrive at nine too, or he could thrive at two as well. But um, yeah. it's going to be interesting. That's going to make Justin very important suddenly. Like, get healthy. You're an important, dude. And you're going to have a lot of dudes in front of you. Um, you know, named Walsh, Otani. Um, you know, and 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 so it's and Trout. It's going to be important to see how Justin comes back healthy. Absolutely. Perfect. So, just a couple more questions for you. Once again, we appreciate the time. Darren Sutton joining us today. Um, so, Vince Scully, Jerry Coleman, Dick Emberg. Southern California has had a rich history of famous voices in baseball. What does it feel to be part of a territory, once again, that has such a rich history and just the such golden voices in baseball? That doesn't fall, on, that doesn't fall at all on me without complete awareness. Um, obviously, Vinny called my dad's games, and so did Ross Porter. Um, and there's a personal side for me with Ross. His son, Wes, is my, my best friend, um, you know, best man at my wedding. And I watched how to research being a broadcaster from Ross's home because he was like a second dad. A unique and quirky style, certainly. And glad to be the lieutenant to Vince Scully, who was the captain. Um, it doesn't at all fall shy on me. Like every time I came in as a visitor at the Big A and sat or at Dodger Stadium, I sat. 
Um, yeah, I'm always humbled by it. These were the guys who taught me how to be a broadcaster. And then, you know, obviously switching gears, as you mentioned, with the legend of Dick Ember and Don Drysdale and, and the, the words that they used to describe baseball and the heart and soul they had. And even I'll include my partner, Mario and Pemba, when I came here, who still is like a big brother to me, who's one of the big voices historically of baseball in Southern California. I mean, um, part of some big moments. And, and now you transition in, into Rory. And, you know, I honored him in a tease we did the other day, who just had joy and a big voice and fit the bill of yep. Hollywood. Yep. Uh, and now Terry obviously taking and, you know, taking that, that torch for a generation. So, yeah, I, I'm humbled. I, you know, I got to keep my game up. And, and I'll include Victor, too. I mean, a generation for what he did, the joy he brought, the excitement, touch the fan base, coin some unique calls that people still want to hear. I mean, that's doing your job, man. Um, being there for the big moment, he certainly was, and all these guys. So, yeah, it doesn't fall short on me at all. That's absolutely awesome. Yeah, I mean, I grew up listening to a lot of these voices, as did all of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can only imagine what it's like trying to, you know, model yourself after these guys because, you know, obviously when you're growing up, these are the voices you hear. So you, you want to one day be a Vince Scully. It's, it's natural. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yet you also want to be yourself. Yeah, have your own flair. That's for sure. And that you do. I mean, you bring a lot of, uh, you know, your reactions with Gooby and Moda. Uh, and, you know, when you talk to Tim Salmon sometimes, I mean, it, it's it's really cool, Darren. We, we just wanted to let you know we, we really appreciate what you're doing. And, uh, like, we miss Re Victor, too. But, uh, you know, you've made it a smooth transition. I don't think anyone's, like, going, oh, man, Darren's calling the game. No, I mean, we, <laughs> we, we love hearing you. And uh, you do a really good job. I know at times with the COVID, you know, you've had to call outside of the stadium or, or via truck. And I know that's probably a little frustrating, but uh, but you don't make it feel like that, you know. When you were obviously saying, "Hey, we're calling it from the booth or from the truck," you were you were like you were there, and that's that's what uh, a good broadcaster does. Uh, you made the best of a situation, and uh, you know you you guys had to really work differently in your entire career, and uh, you didn't sound like you were calling from a truck, basically. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'll always thank my, you know, my partners with Perfect Game, you know, in the, the development space. Because last year, even when MLB hadn't cranked up, we were doing remote games all the time. Oh. And so I was yeah. learning the technology as an executive producer and a host on one side. Now, our technology is killer and it's expensive <laughs> and it's amazing. For the yeah. We don't have that kind of budget in my little shop over here. That being said, the concept of timing, of working with others, I called a 12U All-American game. I was here in Scottsdale. Someone else was in New York, uh, the young, talented uh, Danny Wexelman, who worked with me. And uh, you just get used to it. But now they make it very, very easy. It's a no-excuses zone. This is the big leagues. You had better be prepared and uh, understand that you're not there. Um, and, gosh, it's a job that's coveted. So you will never, ever hear me complain about it because I actually have been outside the fence looking in. And I was fine with it, very happy with it. But I know what it's like to not have this job, too, in my adult life, in my professional career. So you're not going to hear me complain about not traveling. It's been a wonderful way to do it. I get to know my production team a lot better. They're right outside the door. They're busting their hump just like we all are. So it's 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 been fine for now. Absolutely. Well, I think my final thing on it, I think the fans would realize if you were just going through the motions and we could tell you appreciate yeah. doing what you're doing. And that's what that what translates the best, you know, and. and Fortunately for us Angel fans, no matter what, we've had the best broadcasting crew this year and, and, and in the last few years as well, where radio and TV work just so flawlessly. Yeah, we're lucky. All of us are lucky. We're lucky. You know, Matt was available. We're lucky, certainly, that Gooby is probably the best in the business as it combines prep, as it combines. And I've made that, let me say that again, preparation. Not <laughs> yeah. every analyst in the, Not every analyst in the game prepares like he does. And I mean it with all due respect to everyone that does it. Prep, energy, optimism. Um, he's critical when he needs to be because there has to be a voice of reason, certainly. Yep. Um, mm. But it's it's done with a smile on his face. It's not it's not personal when it's critical. It's done with a smile on his face with a guy who understanding. I've given up eight runs in the big leagues before too. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you know, and from my perspective, I, I got released from a ball with a double digit ERA. This game's hard. I know it. Jose obviously is amazing to work with his depth and talent. As a matter of fact, his perspective, and I know you guys are watching your clock, his perspective oh, no, you're for good. Jose, if I could take just a second, yeah. is so mm -hmm. deep. Of course. Is so, he sees things that are so deep that a lot of times we almost wish we had a second show for him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, 
he sees things that I never see. And I played, but not like he played. He played in the freaking big leagues, right? And, yeah. and he's got it coursing through his veins. But he's down there. He sees things that I'm blown away by. So to have his insights all of a sudden, along with Gooby, um, look, I work with Mark Grace, who was amazing. I work with catcher Bill Schroeder in Milwaukee. I've worked with some great analysts at the college level, too. But, I mean, there are very few who touch and see the game like Jose does. And so it's a unique combination. My boys on radio, Mark Langston, always bops in with something to say. Yeah. And uh, they're, fa- they're family, too. They're family, too. So uh, with Trent Rush and, and with, with Terry, who's, you know, kind of always kept in touch with me through the years. Now we're family again. So we appreciate that. Yeah, we, uh, we all love what we do. We're all lucky to have our jobs. We all don't take that for granted ever, ever. And I, hope, I do hope it sounds like that because we really don't. Uh, I've always considered myself, I don't know if I can spin it around the right way. There's a bunch of press passes over my shoulder oh, there there you go. in my life's journey. <laughs> there you go. I've always considered myself just a fan with the press pass. That's really all I am. So if I ever stop sounding like that, I need to go home. I need to stop. You know, if, if, that, uh, if that joy goes away, then I'll probably go home. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Absolutely. So final thing to close out. For all the little boys and girls out there who one day want to be in a broadcast booth, what recommendation do you have to them? Boy, it's great because technology is now new for them and they're comfortable with speaking, communicating. Some of it's bad in social media, but a lot of it's good. Take advantage of that. Be creative. Do things that I couldn't even do. Edit things that, you know, that show, um, you know, your life. If you're uh, involved with gymnastics or dance, you know, go shoot and edit things. Learn how to create content. Now, if you want to be a speaker, speak all the time. If you're in ninth grade and you guys are having a, an assembly, ask to speak and write, write, write. I can't tell you enough because ultimately what I'm doing for three hours a night is writing with my mouth. That's what I'm doing. Write <laughs> all the time and speak anytime you can get in front of a microphone. You get to college, they don't have a great broadcast department, make one up. Go there and do PA for the women's lacrosse team. Just create your own space. That's my advice. Get your experience. That's good. All right, we'll pass that along. Darren, thank you so much as we're running out of time. I know you have a prior engagement too, and I really would like to, uh, on behalf of everyone at uh, Halos in the infield, just want to thank you for your, your time and doing what you do. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Keep being a fan, and we'll keep being a fan as well. We love what you bring to the broadcast team and what you bring as a human being. So keep it up. Take care. God bless, and thanks again for the time. God bless you guys as well. Thank you very much. All right, Darren. Have a good one. Be well, guys.